the message that I'd like to discuss today is something that I find rather remarkable in an amazing way, and I'm probably going to use that word a heck of a lot. As a Christian, we should not get amazed at what we get amazed at. I frankly don't get amazed when we see a miracle or a testimony. We have so many, we have a few that we might share with you today. On the contrary, I get amazed that someone can be born again. Apparently, supposedly, spirit-filled and not walk in the supernatural. Without the supernatural, Christianity is virtually meaningless. What distinguishes us, we'll see in a moment, from other religions or types of belief is that fact that God will authenticate himself, that he'll answer a prayer. I often try to describe it this way, that in many of the books of the Bible, when people are praying to statues or false gods, one method that God uses to try to get them to see the light is that he mocks that kind of thinking. And he does it in the fashion where he says, where's your God? Why how come he's not standing up for you? Why doesn't he answer your prayer? Uh, why doesn't he show up? Why doesn't he manifest? And over and over again, God uses that line of thinking to say, well, that's the difference. One God is completely alive and the creator of all, and the other is a figment of someone's imagination called religion. It's a nice idea, sounds good, feels good, but it can't do a lick for you. So I, the next few minutes I'd like to discuss the problem, because the end of this message we're going to get to the problem. And hence, then, we therefore have the solution if we would stop engaging in the problem. But let's set a little groundwork. Right at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image. Now, up to this point, it just says, God said, God said, and God said, God said. But here, he takes counsel. He's apparently speaking with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. And he says, let us, thinking through this, the pinnacle of his creation, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. He continues to repeat the fact that we're going to be just like him. It's a, a remarkable entry into the Bible. We shouldn't just read it and gloss over it, but we should spend a few moments thinking about this because it's extraordinary. You can't just say that. If someone were to tell you tomorrow, hey, you're going to be just like Bill Gates, you wouldn't continue reading. You'd go, what do you mean? You'd want, whoa, what do you mean by that? Because you know the consequence, the opportunity behind that. You mean to tell me I'm going to have money like Bill Gates? You'd be interested in the conversation. But we say, let us make men in our image and likeness. And it, it's just a verse. Let's continue because this is amazing. And let them have dominion, basically over everything. He doesn't say, let us have dominion. He says, let them have dominion. Extraordinary. You, you got to hear this. Because if so, you'll have a life of dominion. If not, the tragedy of all tragedies, that you can be born again, and God hasn't changed the rules. He said, you must be born again. But the moment the must is you are in a life of dominion, a life of power, a life of favor. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. It means something. So he says, let them have dominion over the beast, the, the, his creation. And then, so God created man. He repeats it in his image, repeats it again. In the image of God made he them, and he made them male and female. He created them. Then. Next verse, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it and have dominion. Again, over the fish of the sea, the cross. That's a way of saying over everything. And then he goes, and behold, 
I have given you every herb, another way of saying, and you have everything at your disposal. You're the head of it. You have dominion. You have an issue with a bank, you have dominion. Whether you believe it or not, you have dominion. You've got to start taking dominion. People have to start speaking to some storms and say, peace, be still. You have to get comfortable. You have to come to grips. The reason, and I'm gonna say this a few times, the rules have never changed. From the very beginning, you have dominion. And then in the New Testament, you must be born again. The reason being is the minute you are, this power, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you can now engage in power. But most Christians, frankly, either they don't believe this stuff or they've so, been so brainwashed by society that they think somebody else is the answer and not them. Oh yeah, there's a couple of superstar Christians, but they could never be like that. That is such a damnable lie from the pit of hell that it's extraordinary in and of itself. It's remarkable that people don't understand who they are. You must consider your origin. When he says you must be born again, there are two births, your natural birth, which is natural, governed by physics and gravity and all the natural laws. But the must be born again aspect is a spiritual birth that absolutely takes precedent over the natural. And there you're born in the spirit, in the image of God, in his likeness, created to have dominion and subdue the earth. That's why at the end of his gospels, he said, and now I'm God and I have all power has been given unto me. Now you, because of that, you go do your job and preach the gospel and heal the nations and do miracles, signs and wonders. Why the Bible says in 1 John that we've overcome the world, how? By our faith. Faith is, listen, hope is for the future. It's wonderful to hope that one day you'll graduate or buy a nice car and get married or whatever. But faith is now. Faith is in possession this instant. Our good at hope, but it ain't one drop of what faith is. You have to realize, you have to come to grips of your divine origin. You have to recognize, get comfortable that he said, give them dominion in our likeness, in our image. That's why when we pray as a corporate body with everyone connected all over the world, the miracles are astounding. This lady who they told her the baby, there was no remedy. So she said, well, if there's no remedy, then I don't have to do anything other than believe God. And she anointed her baby. Immediately, the baby started gaining weight. They said he couldn't eat, couldn't gain weight. Within three days, the doctor's saying, we don't know what's happening, but he's leaving the neonatal unit. This is a death sentence, a death sentence. And the baby's home and gaining weight, fine, with no indication. A mother with a little bit of anointing oil. But there's an issue. There really is. Let's go there. First Kings. You all know this story. Can't get any more famous than this one. Elijah combating not the 400 prophets, 850 prophets, if you read the Bible, right? Interesting lesson. Fantastic. But we have to believe it. And we have to engage. We're not participants in an arena. You're in the ball game. You're not in the crowd. You're not an observer. You're the player. You're going to win. God designed you to win. He never designed you to lose. He ne don't believe that line. Don't believe that. People say, well, the world, the Bible says you'll have tribulation in the world. Keep reading. And he says, yeah, and I've overcome the world. Keep reading. Keep reading. Don't stop there. Keep reading. So there's a challenge. Like today, they don't know who's God. The multitudes are serving this and their own agenda, and they think they're doing right. I'm not, I'm not saying they're evil. They're just completely wrong. And the Bible says, this is how it's summed up. How long are you going to not know and have two opinions? One day you're hot, one day you're cold. You're the Laodicean church. How long are you going to be this way, flipping over and over? Because I got an idea. Why don't you call in the name of your God, I'll call in the name of my God. And get this, this is kind of wonderful. And the God who answers, what do you think? 
maybe that's God. They go, boy, we never thought of it that way. Let's go. And they give it their all, all day. They're doing everything they thought would bring down God, walking on their knees, whipping themselves to blood, chastising themselves, fasting. They're going out of their minds physically to get God to do something. Well, it's difficult to get no God to do something, so nothing happens. He then prepares things. I'll leave the details out. But he says, oh God, now he prays. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known this day. You see, God wants it to be known. God doesn't hide himself. If you're not getting your prayers answered, it's not God. Be honest with yourself. Even if you can't talk to a counselor, go in your bathroom, look in the mirror, and be honest. It's not God. And say, now what does God want of me that I'm not getting my prayer answered? Not that he wants anything from you. He wants to adjust you to be better. He's not trying to hurt you or get something from you. He's trying to say, you got to stop doing that. So I'm just getting your attention and let's stop doing that stuff and let's clean our lives up a little bit. He just wants you to pause or it could be simply the testing of your faith, which is a beautiful thing. Don't dismay. God only tests people their faith who are going to pass the test. He doesn't set you up for a failure. I am telling you, if you are those ones that are right now are in that crucible and you're wondering where's my door to open where's my prayer being answered don't go negative that's not what i meant before it's a testing of your faith and he would never not ever put you in a position to not pass that test never you already passed it you just don't know it would you put your little baby on a little bicycle, push him away and not put training wheels or hold him? You just fling him and so he could break his knee on the curb? Well, you as a father or mother wouldn't do that. And believe me, God is slightly better than us as parents. He ain't sending you on no training bike where you're going to fall. So he goes, hey, God, let it be known that you're God. Show them. And also let it be known that I'm your servant. What a prayer. You should pray that when you walk to pray in someone's home or a hospital or in a church. You should say, hey, yeah, God, I need for them to know that Jesus is Lord. But you better tell them I'm your man or woman too. I'm not going to be up here like a jerk. I stand before a throne. They need to know that. What a prayer. What guts. What character. What a man who believes in the supernatural and says, I'm here. I'm not walking on a plank. I'm on the rock. I'm standing here on my Jesus. Now, God, come through and show them. Wow. And you know what God did? Now, he didn't say, oh, how disrespectful. God doesn't get nervous, ladies and gentlemen. He loves when someone compels him. He loves when you're forceful and violent. He loves when you say, I'm not giving up, God. You're going to say yes, and I'm commanding you concerning the work of your hands. Let everybody else get nervous, but you develop a relationship with your Jesus. It's amazing. But God says we have to be like children. He's your father. Get comfortable. Sit on his lap, pull on his beard, and say, come on, come through for me. And boy, will he ever. Will he ever. He's a supernatural God. Don't take that out of your life. It's useless to be like everybody else. You don't have the right to be like everybody else. You're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. You're bearing false witness. You don't have the right to be like everybody else. You're not a member of a church. You're a member of a family of God. You're the daughter or son of Jesus Christ. Don't take the anointing out of this. And it's you that's anointed. That's why you must be born again. The rules have never changed. The moment you're born again, you had faith to receive Christ. So now don't tell me you don't have faith. You had faith. You have the key to a huge, well, for Laura's sake, house on a beach. This huge house right on the water. And you got this big golden key. You go up to the door, you open it, you're in. You're born again. You had the faith to get in. Now in this mansion on the beach with hundreds of doors, 
They all require the same key. But you're going to stand in the hallway. I'm telling you, that's what Christians do. They get in, they're in. And now they take the key and put it away. No faith for the business. No faith for the ministry. No faith for the healing. No faith for the opportunity. No faith for the miracle. They were all supernatural to get in. You must be born again from above. They're in. And now, all of a sudden, I don't have faith. Who told you that lie? If you had faith to get born again, you have absolutely enough faith to do whatever you require. Absolutely. Nobody can tell you you don't. Don't you tell you you don't. I said it last week. Stop talking yourself out of your blessing or miracle. Stop it. Stop it. Start declaring. Say, like I said, say to that storm, you're going to be quiet in the name of Jesus. Say to that job opportunity, that belongs to me. My God, give God a chance in the supernatural. Why does Isaiah said that we are signs, wonders, and miracles? Why is there a Red Sea? Why is there a sun stand still? Why is there a Jericho wall collapses on its own? Why is there a Jordan River? Why? Why? Why is there the healings all throughout the Bible? The dead raised, a Christ resurrected. Why? I mean, the plagues. Why? How in heaven's name do we take this glorious book and turn it into natural and just live normal lives? As Paul said, you're walking like you're a mere human being. What is that all about? So the challenge, the God that answers, that's God. Imagine the position you can put God in. Didn't you say, Lord Father, respectfully, Daddy, that it's the God that answers, that that's how I would know, that you would teach me that way, you would affirm me that way, you'd make me confident, you'd hold up my arms, you'd make me proud of my Father, you'd give me a testimony where I could testify of you. Isn't that what you said? You think he's going to let you down? Really? Never. Not ever. He'd be so happy that you dared to believe. So happy that you spoke up. So happy that you recognized the power of him. That his heart would burst to affirm you, to answer by fire. The God that answers. Let him be God. And then he explains, like we just read, that they may know that you're God. God wants people to know he's God. That's why he suffered. God, that they may know you're God, Lord. If you answer my prayers, if you give me a testimony, they will know that it wasn't coincidence. It wasn't an education. It wasn't a good, it was God, they'll know. And then they'll know something that I'll cherish forever, you would say. They'll know that I'm your baby daughter or son, and I can have that. Oh, what a relationship he wants with us. And so, of course, you know, it's, this is what we studied in Malachi. It said that then they would open their hearts and they would turn back to God. The fire came down, he answered, and the people shouted, yeah, it's the Lord that's God. Yeah, he's God. You don't have to debate. Paul said he wouldn't. Paul said he would come there and demonstrate. Simple, try it, dare to believe. Pray for the sick, pray for a miracle. Launch out, try. You're not going to get it by sitting on your duff. But when you get aggressive for God and do something, watch, he's more aggressive than you. <laughs> He'll answer faster than you think. He's amazing. Amazing. But now we come to the problem because this is the problem. 
And this is a pretty tough teaching what I'm about to say. If you don't hear it with an anointed ear, it may get you a little angry. The reason it may get you a little angry is because we've probably all been here. And so it might cut and convict. But why not? Just listen. Again, one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Again, the way it's re related, it's uncanny. And that's the 12 spies. As they're about to enter into the land, think about this, they're about to finally get their prayers answered in such a way, all the provision, the success, the bounty is right there. They're on the very edge and the spies go in. The spies come back and they cannot say that it wasn't as God said. They had to affirm, yeah, everything he said is true. The land is gorgeous. The cities are amazing, waiting for us. The farms, the vineyards, it's better. They even have the fruit on display, supernatural fruit. But then 10 men begin to talk. Here's the problem to the supernatural. They begin to say that they know better than God. No, 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 no. Yeah, everything he said is right, but we have a few observations of our own and we have a couple of hindrances. We think we should listen to what we have to say. And they begin to cast doubt. They begin to say, this is never gonna work. It's absolutely what he said, but, but let's go back. Let's, let's go back. And the nation gives their ear, here comes the tough part, to 10 men, as I said, who are now displaying that they know better than God. And the people are listening. Yeah, you know, he's got a point there. They don't stop to analyze, who am I talking to? It's going to get tough. These people had no fruit, no success, no nothing. And now they're going to say they know better. Let's not do what God said. That is the prevalent problem in Christianity, that Christians give their ear to people, I'm sorry to say it, that are essentially tares among the wheat, who all they want to do is take you backwards. Remember what, something happened 10 years ago. Criticize, they all have the same characteristics. Criticizing people, casting doubt, making you separate from your family, your churches, telling you this, but do you realize that if you Google Joel Osteen, the first 500 websites are critical of this man. Well, you envious, jealous little bitch. Really? That's all you are. That's all you are. You're just a dog. That's all you are. No one in their right mind. I tell you what, if you had that ministry, would you say no to it or would you take it? Are you serious? This is an anointed vessel of God. Why are you trying to find a grain of sand somewhere where you did? What spirit is that? It's the 10 spies. They stopped, 10 men stopped a nation of millions of people on the edge, the edge to cross over and get everything. It's a spirit, man. Instead of covering and suppose somebody did make a mistake. Your job is to cover, to forgive, to be Jesus. Your job is to pray for them, not talk about them, pray for them, not talk. But with all that negativity and doubt going around, you'd have to be Samson to have faith. Because you hear negative about this church. You realize I get pastors calling me to tell me bad things about other pastors. I go, are you out of your mind? I don't have time. What are you doing? Don't give your ear. Who are you listening to? Tell me that T.D. Jakes tomorrow is going to call you to criticize the past. Just tell me that stupidity. Never. He's a glorious man. These men are giants. Yet people want to criticize them left and right. People want to criticize everybody from a, a subgroup leader with three people to a magnificent church. The attack of the enemy is to cause doubt schism to break it apart stop unity because we have an army but if you separate them all over the world and they're never in unity they can't do very much listen 
The problem is exactly that. Stop listening to negativity. Don't allow your ear. Why would God give you power? Why would he let the supernatural reign in your life if people would use it for a destructive way? Why? Why? Why is he going to give you anointing to manifest and flourish and multiply if you're not going to use it properly? It's designed to save and heal, to forgive, to preach the good news. Not to sit in, you know, somebody with their pants up there on a phone or a Google or a blog writing horrible things about somebody. That'll never happen. Ten men stopped the move of God for over 40 years. Ten men who thought they knew more and better than God, who had an opinion and verbalized it. And the crowd, yeah. Yeah, you know, you got a point there. Let's go backwards. Always wanting to talk about what happened last year. Always, did you know what he did when he was drunk last year? You sure he should be in the choir? Why, I got a, a I can't be specific, but I get a phone call from one of our churches, and they want to tell me about this girl's lifestyle. And, well, are you aware she's on the platform? And I go, you're on the platform. <laughs> Did you forget? You forgot. You got forgiven, right? Now you want to point out this little... Are you crazy? Who, who, who doesn't have a past? Who hasn't committed a mistake? It's the love of God that comes and forgives you and covers you and then says, I forgave you, now go forgive my baby. What I gave you, give my baby. I love this scripture, memorize it. I know you know it, but that doesn't mean what I mean when I say memorize it. When I say memorize it, engraft it. So it's a knee-jerk reaction. Not that I know the scripture, no, I live the scripture. This is the scripture. Don't get angry at me. I say to myself every day, even a fool, if he keeps his mouth, is going to be seen as wise. And I'm about to, Ray, shut up. 90% of what I want to say, I thank God I didn't say it because 95% of it was wrong. So cut this. Stop judging. Don't be among the 10 spies and certainly don't be one of them. And then God can say, I can trust you. I can give you dominion and power, I can allow that spirit of authentic to come on you. The world will know that I am God through you. I will manifest in you. So I repeat, if you're going to try to live Christianity in a normal manner, you have failed before you begin. You have to believe for the wonders. You have to believe that he can turn you around like a top and make you successful this afternoon. Look at Ruth from one minute to the next. Look at Naomi from one minute to the next. Look at a little Esther. In a second, she's a queen. Think about these things. Think of Peter, a coward, and now he's bold to preach the gospel all over the world. Think about these things. Think of Gideon hiding. And next minute, he's running a nation and an army. God can do it. He wants to do it. He wants you to beloved prosper above all things. But first, your soul. Take control. Believe for the wonders. Dare to believe in the supernatural God. He much rather deal with you in the miracle realm than the natural realm. Can you believe that? He much rather do a miracle for you than just put a bowl of oatmeal in front of you. He wants you to give you the oatmeal factory. But Christians just won't believe this stuff. He's looking. One of my favorite scriptures, and I'm just going from here to there right now, somebody's gonna grab one of these scriptures and it'll be their foundation. Remember, when you grab a scripture, this I'm not digressing, Jesus defeated the enemy by quoting the word of God. You can change your life by quoting the word of God. Get a word, get a scripture, get that. The eyes of the Lord, how about this for one? 
run to and fro the entire earth. God is on a search. He's on an errand. He's looking to achieve something. You know what it is? To find one individual somewhere where he can manifest like he did for Elijah. I can show the world that I'm God. Where is that individual? And he's searching for people that will go, here I am. Stop your search. I'm right here. Use me. Conform me. You know, you have to offer him your humanity. Oh boy, if only you would hear that. You have to yield and offer God your humanity. And then he'll turn it into a supernatural being with supernatural power and authority.